Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Anna from the TUC and I'm really pleased today to be joined by Ivor, an experienced ULR. Um, I'll let him introduce himself first. Hi, uh, so, so my name's Ivor Riddell. Um, I'm a lead ULR on South Eastern Railways and uh, I work out of Gillingham uh, Guards Depot and I cover pretty much all of the South East Network. Um, so today's webinar um, is going to be either telling us about his experience as a ULR um, and sharing some ideas and tips with us. Um, we've, we're happy to take as many questions as we can from you, so please do get involved. You can post your questions for either in the Ask a Question section, which is below this screen. And please do chat to each other in the uh, chat panel that's on the, the right hand side of the screen. We've also posted um, four or five poll questions, so uh, do take part and get involved. Um, if we don't manage to get through every question today, uh, we're going to ask Ivor to come back and do another webinar with us. Um, so just keep sending the questions in and we'll see how many we get through. OK, so first question, um, what's the best thing about being a ULR? Well, I think really the, the, the first, the best thing about being a ULR really is, is the difference that you can make to people's lives. It's um, it's th those moments when it's, it's an old quote, but when you see the light of learning in somebody's eyes and they really get it, yeah. that's that's a wonderful moment. Uh, they're, they're small moments, but they happen quite often if you're lucky, and, and they do make a real difference and they make you feel good as well. I mean, perhaps a, a, an interesting anecdote for that would be many years ago we had a learning centre at Chatham, and there was a, a, a woman who worked on the, the barriers at Strood. Um, and she she was what you call a technophobe nowadays, I suppose. Um, she didn't want to do uh, IT or computers or anything. She was in her early 50s, and her sister lived in Australia. And so she was talking to one of the other ULRs about this and saying that she only got to speak to her every three months uh, on the phone, which cost a bit of money and wasn't ideal because she hadn't seen her for over 15 years and she really missed her. So uh, the... The rep said, well, why don't, why don't you send her emails and stuff and then communicate that way? And she said, oh, no, I won't touch IT. It's, it's a nightmare. So he invited her to come over to the learning centre uh, just to have a look at, at what we do over there and maybe set up an email address. And, and she came across the following week with the ULR. And we sat down with a computer in front of her and we explained about how to set up an email address without going into too much detail about computers and stuff to frighten her off. And she set up her email address and she actually sent an email to her sister there and then, which was quite a powerful moment for her. But after a few weeks, she was coming in once a week to use a computer to, to send messages to her sister. And her sister was sending photos back. We taught her how to upload photos and they had a real dialogue going. And uh, the, the ULR involved um, actually contacted her sister without her knowing and, and said, would you be able to um, be in the room at a certain time? when she comes over because we wanted to try and set up a video link for her and uh, she agreed so it was about three weeks after that this lady came in sat down and he said right we're going to do uh msn messenger now so we can do a live video feed um so i'll show you how to do it, how all that works and they did about 15 minutes work and then she opened it up and there was her sister staring back at her on the screen and she just melted into tears and it was a really a really powerful moment and after that, she, she was down at the Learning Centre every other day, basically, chatting to her sister nonstop. And, uh, and then she got a computer at home, so she didn't need us anymore, and she moved on. And uh, in the end, through, through that medium, they actually arranged for her sister to come back to, to the UK for a couple of weeks and stay. And it's, it was just a real powerful moment that, that made a real difference to someone's life. And those are the small wins that you need to concentrate on as a ULR. Yeah, I think that maybe gets lost sometimes. The mm. small wins are just as important as the big ones. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's a really good example of um, of, of, a, of a, a learner um, getting involved. Mm. But um, how do you persuade people who maybe aren't so aren't so keen on learning straight away, either members or colleagues? How do you get them inspired? Well, as a little bit of salesmanship goes on, I guess um, part part of our job is to sell the dream of, of, of lifelong learning. Uh, again, use, using a, another analogy to, to to illustrate that, there was, um, again, at, at the Learning Centre in Chatham several years ago, when we were first 
working with Southeastern on on learning lifelong learning and, and setting up the learning agreement. The the chap in charge of HR at the time was a chap called Nigel Cotton. It's quite old school. It was sort of early sixties, pinstripe suit. Didn't really get all this lifelong learning and and, and sort of personal development stuff that well. And um, so I arranged for him to come down and meet us at the Chatham Learning Centre to chat through it, and I'd show him some bits and pieces of evidence and what have you, see if I could persuade him to get on board and support us. But at the same time, there was a, a chap uh, called Andy who was a he was a driver uh, on the railway for many many years, and he had several fatalities within a short space of time, which meant he he developed some mental health issues and, and couldn't continue as a driver, which was very sad. So he, he left the job under capability. Then later on, back 10 years after this, 10, 15 years after this, his wife Sue was actually working as a conductor at Gillingham. And she said to me, as she spoke to me in, 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 the, in the restroom, to say, oh, Andy's thinking about coming back as a guard, but he's, he's not very sure how that's going to work out. He's not done an interview for about 25 years or so, so he's really nervous. And I said, well, bring him down to the centre and we'll have a chat with him. So he came down and we had a bit of a chat and uh, he explained what the issues were. He wasn't comfortable with his, his maths and English skills and uh, interview techniques, all the, all the stuff that people are normally nervous about. So we contacted, or myself contacted HR for South Eastern and asked if they could actually send some um, packs that they send to new entrants in advance to prepare them for an assessment which they agreed to do. They sent six different um, types of pack or versions of the pack, uh, which came down. Andy came down the following week and we sat him down and we said, okay, here's a test. Uh, just take your time, go through it, see how you get on. And it took him about just over two hours to complete. Uh, it didn't do very well. It, I think it was about 42%, something around that. Um, so it would have been a fail, uh, which he wasn't too happy about, obviously. But he said, don't panic. That's just the start of the system. So you've got seven weeks until your assessment. Come back next week. We'll do a bit of work on your English, your maths, a uh, little bit of interview skills. And we worked with him for, for, the, for the five or six weeks beforehand. The week before he was due to go up for his assessment, uh, we brought him in and uh, basically put the, the assessment pack in front of him and said, right, this is the real thing, timed assessment, crack on. And he did. Uh, and he got 87%, uh, which was more than a pass. Uh, he was buoyed up, filled in with confidence, and he went away quite happy. Well, the day, going back to Nigel Cotton, the day Nigel Cotton came down was the same day that Andy had his assessment. And I was sitting there drinking a cup of tea in the office with Nigel about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, trying to convince him of the, the ways of the world. And he was kind of coming across. And all of a sudden, the door just swung open, and Andy was stood there, and he went, oh, I've done it! I've done it! And it was great. I couldn't have written it better, really. I, I, just, I just looked at Nigel and that's what it's all about. <laughs> and, and he got it. <laughs> well, that's a great story about persuading an employer. Um, mm. But and I, um, I imagine it was really, really helpful and really powerful. Mm. But um, have you got any other everyday sort of tips about yeah. um, rather than the one off sure. amazing incidents, yeah. but also the everyday yeah. kind of things? Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's not the norm, to be, to be fair. <laughs> it's brilliant, it. Yeah, it is. And although those are really powerful, you hold on to those stories. But yeah, I mean, there, there's lots of other things. You have got to be able to sell it. You've got to be a little bit professional when you approach them. Make sure that you do stuff uh, in, on, in paper and, and, and outline your case. Uh, try and set up a meeting uh, with your manager. Your local manager is normally the one you need to sell it to first of all because you're going to be going to him or her for release time and things like that. Um, so just make your case. Um, maybe do a learning needs analysis around the workplace so that you can gauge exactly what people want to learn um, and how they want to learn it. And, and then go with that information, go to your manager and, and try and convince them because a lot of managers will just look at you and think you're just trying to blag a day off. Uh, we, we all know what that's like. Um, so you, you've got to try and turn that round. And, and it's about building relationships with your manager, with your roster clerk, if you've got one, and people like that. And actually building relationships so they trust you, and, and then you can you can work from that position of trust. Um, I can see the questions are flooding in, Thanks. so I'm going to have a quick look um, at some of those. Um so we've had a question um, from Pete. He says, um, 
can you give some guidance about how much work time you would suggest that ULR needs to fully complete their role without causing grief in the workplace? Um, he knows it's a little bit how long is a piece of string, yeah. but good to hear your views. Okay. Hi, Pete. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it is very much um, how, how, what, what your circumstances are in your workplace now. If you're, if you're quite lucky and you, you've got a, a learning agreement in your workplace, then that will actually be set out for you how much release time you're entitled to and you kind of have to make do with that. The reality is most reps, not just learning reps, but other reps, do a lot of stuff in their own time. That, that's the reality of it. We all do that because we want it to work. But as for requesting paid release, um, you're entitled to paid release for your training um, anyway. And you're entitled to reasonable release under law for to carry out your duties as a learning rep or, or any rep. Um, so it's about, it's about building that relationship, again, with, with the manager or who's responsible for your release uh, and then agreeing with them what is reasonable. Now, within my situation with South Eastern, we've actually got a learning agreement which stipulates we're allowed one day a month release. But what's really important actually is that we take that release because that, that's a lot of the problems stem from some ULRs don't take the release when they're entitled to it because they think, well, I won't ask this month, I haven't really got anything on. You still need to take that release because it's really important that you keep that going because even if you, if you stand down and you haven't taken any release, the next person who comes in starts asking for it. They say, well, nobody else bothers with it. Why do you need it? So we've got to be very careful that we do take that release and use it for something, even if it's just going out there, talking to the members, finding out what's going on in the workplace, and do a little bit of recruiting on the side if you can, because we're all members of a trade union and we want people to join us. Um, so this is a kind of link question about facility time, um, where someone's asked um, how do you, how you approach it and what do you do if there's a management conflict with this? So maybe that relates to what you've just said and that, um, you said there's one day a month. Is that one day per ULR or one day that you all share? Or Okay, so within our learning agreement, it's one day per ULR. Uh, every month. Uh, I'm a lead learning rep, uh, which is a, a thing that, that sort of, I don't know if it does it in other industries, but so within the railway industry, that's common. Um, within London Transport, they call it a co coordinating ULR. Um, so basically, we, we have a group of ULRs that we coordinate and support, normally someone with a bit more experience. And oh, there go the, the lights. Yeah, the <laughs> lights have just gone off. We'll get Not to worry. On. So yeah, I've lost I've lost track now. Um, about facility time and right. how that works in your workplace. Yeah, yeah. So so basically, we we've got that that in place. The lead learning rep because they've got a wider wider scope of duties. They get one day a week, which is actually quite a significant investment by the company because uh, it's actually one fifth of my working week. Now I don't always get that because uh, the circumstances they can't cover the work, so I would have to work through. But then I'll, I'll work with them and say, well, I'll need two days off later on in the year. But the, the key thing is not to be frightened to ask for it. It's yours by, by right. You're entitled to it. Even if you haven't got a learning agreement, under law, you're still entitled to a reasonable time off. So you can make that argument. And, and that's how, how you go about it. So you mentioned a learning agreement there. Um, how, if, if somebody doesn't have a learning agreement in place, um, and obviously that's the ideal, mm. how would you advise to go about moving on from there? Okay, so again, it, it requires a little bit of courage to, to speak up. I mean, that that's one of the things about a rep, they put their head above the parapet a little bit. That, that's part of your job, part of your role. Um, so again, it, it's about approaching people and having, having the courage to just say, look, this is my job or this is my role within the union. I'm entitled to this time off. Now, it could be that your employer will just say, no, clear off, or the manager will just say, no, clear off, I'm not interested. But then it becomes an industrial issue. If, if you're prepared to go down that road, it becomes an industrial issue. It goes through a grievance procedure. You get other reps involved and things like that because you do have a statutory right under law to a reasonable time off, the same as any other rep. Um, another question we've had from a viewer, and um, this is from Jackie. Um, she asks, um, if your workplace has a learning and development directorate which continually trains and develops staff, how can a ULR add value to that? Wow, okay. Yeah, so mo most companies have got a learning and development of some kind uh, which teaches, which trains the staff 
to, to carry out their role in the workplace, and, and that's fine. Um, so how, how do we actually add value to that? Well, we, we can convince them that we add value because our, our core role as a ULR is functional skills. That's why the ULR was set up in the first place, to address the functional skills gap in the workplace. That hasn't gone away. There are a lot of people out there who struggle with reading, writing, and arithmetic, and IT as well. So it, it's, we, we will add value by giving people the basic skills so they can go on and do the company training that they need to in their role. And that very much impacts on health and safety as well. Certainly within the rail industry, um, the, the cleaning grades, um, they tend to be low paid jobs. Quite often people will have um, learning difficulties with, with reading and writing uh, and adding up, um, not through any fault of their own, it's just the way it is. Uh, but they're dealing with very toxic materials, very caustic mm. materials, very dangerous stuff. And, you know, they really need to be able to read the labels and understand what's on those labels. Absolutely. So we would add value by actually making this, the workplace a safer place to be. Um, we've got a question from Sean. Uh, Sean asks, uh, what's the most frustrating part of being a ULR and how can you overcome it? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of frustrations in, in the ULR world. Um, well, one of them is probably the, the biggest one I find on the on the railway is that the, the senior management will buy into lifelong learning all the way along. And they'll say, yeah, this is great. We support you. We'll agree to this. We'll agree to that. Occasionally, you might even squeeze a bit of money out of them if you're really lucky. But then, of course, it comes down to the local manager and it, then it affects their budget. It affects their release time. They've got they're the other ones that have got to release you and pay for that out of their budget. So it's how do you convince them um, that the top, the, the people at the top have said this has got to happen and, and you've got to deliver it. So that, that can be really frustrating at times. Um, but again, it's all about building those relationships and, and just working at it and making a good business case. So have you ever, um, have you got any examples of when you've done that? Um, you told us earlier about um, Andy and mm. Malcolm Cotton. Mm -hmm. So any, have you got any other situations where you've had to convince someone who's a more junior manager mm -hmm. and how you managed to get over that frustration? Yeah, it's interesting, actually. When, when I first started as a ULR, uh, there, there was a lot of suspicion around mm. ULRs just trying to blag time off uh, and things like that. And actually, uh, a friend of mine called Mike Sargent, who was a development worker at the time, he also works as a ULR down in the Dover area. And, um, okay, he, he struggled to convince local managers. They were all very cynical. But he actually started um, doing a, a newsletter, a learning newsletter locally. And one of the things he did in it, he actually had a manager of the month section. So any manager that was actually really supportive or helpful, they got a big shout out in the newsletter saying, yeah, this guy's really good, he's done this. And, and in the end, he ended up getting phone calls from managers saying, why aren't, why aren't I in the magazine this month? I helped you out doing this and, and things like that. So, yeah, it, 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 there's lots of ways of doing it. You've just got to be clever, really. You've just got to think about things outside the box, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Maybe that's something um, people can, can try. Yeah. Um, have a manager of the month feature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've had a question from... Uh, Denise. Denise asks, uh, what taste of days or learning campaigns have you done in your workplace? Uh, which was your favourite to do and why? Ooh, um, you must have quite a lot. I'm yeah, sure. yeah, we've done loads of stuff like that. Absolutely. It, it, it's great fun. Um, we, we, we used to do the, um, well, we still do the Adult Learners Week, uh, which comes up every year, sometimes May, sometimes June, I think. Um, but well, what we would do is we would set up uh, several places around the company because we, we were spread across a whole region. So we'd, we'd, we'd arrange for ULRs to go into certain depots and they would they would set up information tables. Uh, they'd get local people to come in, maybe do a bit of cooking. So some, some areas they'd have someone do curry. Uh, some areas would, would um, do Chinese and things like that. But you're always looking for a hook to get people in the door to talk about learning. Um, in the old in the old days during the war, uh, we, we used to have a little bit of funding uh, through uh, in the, certainly in the southeast area to to buy stuff, and we actually did one where we bought a, a turntable as a digital turntable, and what we said was people can come in with their old favourite album, and while we're actually recording it digitally onto a disc for them, they could actually do a learning needs analysis and and do an assessment That's and things like idea. that. And it worked really well, but food's always the biggest pull. 
Uh, in fact, with, I went to one, it's Houston, about three years ago, and it was, it was called an International Food Festival. But it was, it was a ULR uh, campaign day, basically. And there, there was people from all over the world, because it's very diverse people work at Houston and in that area. So there was loads of different foods to taste, and, and all the management came down to check it out as well, because they could smell the food. <laughs> so it was a great day. He did lots of different things. You've got to have a hook to pull people in, without a doubt. Um, so that's more about taste, uh, taste today. Yeah. But have you done any learning campaigns uh, that a bit more long, you know, um, yeah. longer yeah, term sure. than, than one day that have worked? Yeah, um, we've done. Uh, I'm just trying to think the best. So we, we we did a we did a big push around sign language a few years ago, actually, um, because one of the things I do, I actually do. British Sign Language, because my daughter's deaf. And um, we, we were trying to convince the company to, to take this up and, and actually train frontline staff just in, in basic sign language, not make them experts, but just to sort of so that they've got the confidence to talk to people who use sign language as a first language. And um, we ran this bit of a campaign. We were doing lots of one-day sessions everywhere. But then one of the uh, staff came to me from London Bridge before they redeveloped it all. And um, she said, we'd really like to do it, but um, the, the manager's really on board, but we can't, they won't release people. So they've got to do it in their own time. Of course, they all live a long way away from the station, being in central London. So it's really difficult for them to sort of do this. So we spoke to the manager. And we said it only turns out that during the daytime, there's a bit of a dead patch between the rush hours uh, where there's a lot of staff around doing, uh, I don't say not doing anything, but doing stuff that can be done at other times. So what we did, we convinced them to actually give us a room and uh, we do the whole day course over two days and they would release the set number of staff for, for three hours on each day, two consecutive days in a row to do the whole course. Uh, and we got through about 35 staff doing that, and it was brilliant. It was really empowering, yeah. and they all loved it because it's learning. Who doesn't enjoy learning? And did that then lead on to other learning after they'd done the sign language? Yeah, I think there was three of them actually went on did their level one on their own back, and uh, yeah, that obviously had to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. that's really good. It's yeah. amazing. Um, we've had uh, another question from Jane. Um, Jane asks, how do you celebrate success and really show the value of the work unions do to support learners or learning? So with lots of, um, I'm sure with all your successful stories, you must have some <laughs> celebrations as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it, it, there's all sorts of ways. It, it's used, using the media. So you've got Facebook. Um, within South Eastern, we've got a, a Facebook page called Red Star Learning, uh, which is another story, but... <laughs> It's based around Red Star Parcels Office, basically. So um, so we will put stuff up on there regularly, always take photos. People have got their cameras on their phones now. It's so easy to take a photo. Make sure you get that out on social media. If you want to use Twitter, that's fine. You do have to keep updating that a bit more regularly. Um, but also using the company newsletters, uh, making sure the company are engaged with it and showing that they're supporting it. Um, you've got the Union Let Rep, Rep magazine that the TUC do. I've sent stuff into that before, and that's all worked out really well. They've come out and, and put stories in for us, and they do an online version of that now. So there's lots of ways you can celebrate it, but it is important that you do celebrate it, and it's important that you record it as well so that you can remember what you've done. And Actually, when you look back over the year, you look back and you've probably done a dozen different things over the year and it, it's quite powerful you know mm. you, you look back and say actually i don't feel like i've done anything but when you look on the paperwork it's there yeah it's you know? a great record for you yeah, as absolutely. well yeah. isn't it um so we've had a question from holly uh, holly asks how do you think lifelong learning helps promote the work of the union yeah well that's, that's quite an interesting question actually because it is it is important that we remember as ulrs that we are part of a union you know we are trade union learning reps um, and it's important that we understand that although our main focus is functional skills and lifelong learning and getting people into learning, we are a member of a trade union. And so therefore it is our responsibility, as with every other member of that trade union, to encourage other people to join and to support the organisation of that union. Myself, in the past, when I first got involved, I, I started doing a branch newsletter. Um, because I was quite computer literate and, and I had lots of other stuff that I could put in it. 
We started doing a branch newsletter, which uh, ended up supporting recruitment within the depot. And we actually got other people joining the union within the depot because there was material out there that they could read and see what was going on. To the point actually now, and I'm not saying it's all down to me, we've got a very good recruiting officer in our branch. We've actually now got only one person in the whole depot who's not a member of our trade union, wow. which is quite powerful. And that, that's all about working together. It's working with other reps, mm. supporting what they do. You know, if, if you've got a, if you're quite good at doing posters and things like that, if you've got a health and safety rep who wants to run a campaign on a specific issue, you can support them doing that. Um, also, when you're out and about just doing your ULR duties, now, yes, you're out there doing learning, but there's no harm in carrying a few leaflets with you as well, a few sign-up forms, and just talking to people about the union, what it does, promoting credit union if you've got one, all those sort of things. It's just opening up that conversation about the wider union. And that is so powerful because when you go back to your union and they say, oh, it's just learning, it's a bit fluffy, you know, it doesn't really matter, you say, oh, hang on a minute, you know, we're out there, we're recruiting, we're organising, we're encouraging reps. And, and certainly where you've got reps that have got um, uh, educational needs, um, certainly if you've got foreign language reps, reps who don't use English as their first language, how can you actually organise them to become reps if they can't access the education that the union provides? So the first step is often going to the union learning rep and getting them to do an ESOL course or an English course or something like that so that they can actually move on to the, to the industrial training later on and become reps in the workplace so the ULR is intrinsically part of what the union does the three tenets of any union is organize educate agitate that one in the middle educate that's us that's what the ULRs do so yeah potential for a really powerful role yeah absolutely um, something you mentioned there is is linked to another um another question we've had from Maria um, so Maria asks, what makes people want to be ULRs and how do you recruit? So when you're out talking to people um, about learning, have you managed to recruit some of them to be fellow ULRs as well as actually be learners? Yeah, you have to look out for people who are mentally unstable. <laughs> Sorry, that's just a joke. Um, but yeah, no, it's um, yes, I've, I've recruited loads of ULRs over the years and going to visit different branches. And sometimes it's just about telling people that we need a ULR in that area um, and, and somebody will put their hand up. But it's important also that you make sure, not that they're the right kind of person, but there's someone who's actually going to fit into that role. So that they're going to be enthusiastic. Uh, they're going to want to learn themselves because that's the first thing you've got to do is learn how to have a ULR yourself. They've got to have a little bit of confidence in themselves. Because one of, the, one of the key things when you come back from a, a ULR course or something like that is you go back into the workplace and you're sat in a canteen or a restroom or whatever and there's 50, 60 people out there uh, and they're all talking about the football and, and everything else and you want to talk to them about learning. How do you open that conversation up? Unless you've got the confidence to do that, you end up shrinking back and actually doing nothing. And that's, that's a big danger. It's a danger with all reps, to be fair, mm. um, but specifically because the ULRs, because... Part of your role is actually to be out there engaging with the workforce and, and talking to them and, and getting them interested. Whereas a, a lot of reps, some people say you don't see them unless you're in trouble, which is an old adage. Um, but with a ULR, you must see them because you need to be out there promoting what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, well, Betsy's asked, um, how important is it to have a learning rep in the workplace? Um, no, I guess you're going to say extremely but um no. be, <laughs> but it must be hard to imagine what it would be like if there wasn't a ULR or any ULRs in your workplace but how important do you think it is maybe not in other workplaces as well not mm. just your own yeah it is it is important um I wouldn't say it's it's vital because obviously workplaces do manage without them but you're missing so much if we don't have a work a, a rep in or around that workplace. They don't have to be in a specific workplace, but covering that workplace uh, and engaging with people because education and learning is all about trust. If you don't trust someone, you're not going to learn from them. So it's important that it's somebody you work alongside, uh, somebody that you trust, that understands the situation you're in because quite often people who work maybe nine to five don't really understand what it's like trying to learn when you work in a variable shift pattern. So on the railway, uh, train crew or, or platform staff could be starting at 3.49 one morning 
and then the next morning start at five o'clock not finishing till four o'clock in the afternoon you're shattered the last thing you want to do is go to a learning course mm. so you need to find ways around that to make it easier for people to access the learning so it is important that you have the ulrs in the workplace who work alongside the people who are doing the learning so that they can actually understand the real issues that, that, that the learners face and mm. um, we've had a question from peter asking how do you start to become a ULR um, I imagine we might have some people watching who are reps in workplaces where there isn't a ULR sure. so how do they go about getting on board with learning and bringing it to their colleagues sure okay yeah I mean that, that it, it, it's a very varied pot because every union does it differently first of all you have to be a member of a trade union there's, there's no argument about that. The, the, the keys in the secrets in the title um, but uh, certainly with within my experience on, on the railway uh, they're, they're normally a branch appointment so you would go to your local branch secretary and say i'm interested in being a ulr um are there any vacancies in the area um can i put my name forward you then have to be elected through the branch uh, they would then notify the employer that you're the new union learning rep for that area and then uh you would have to arrange to go on your courses and your training whether it's online training uh, or whether you've got actually got an education uh, facility within your trade union that will provide that. So that that's basically how it starts. It starts at the branch, at the basic level. Um, but it's, it's important that you actually talk to somebody about what that role is, what it entails before you start, so you actually understand where you're going to go with it. Um, but then after you finish your training, or you've at least done stage one mm. of your training, um, what would you recommend is the first thing that a ULR does when they return to the workplace? You Take know, a so deep pick breath. It off. <laughs> 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 okay, so it, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a standard thing that you, you kind of need to know. What do you say? It's like an economist. Now, you need to know your market. Okay, so um, the, first thing you you need, you, 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 the first thing you need to do is find out, actually, do people want learning? Uh, what kind of learning they want, and uh, whether um, how, what are the barriers for them personally to, to actually get to that learning. Some people like doing online learning. Some people, like myself, prefer to sit in a room with a group of people and gossip and, and, and do other stuff and learn through association. There's all sorts of different ways you can learn, but it's important when you go into the workplace, the first thing you do is find out what needs to be delivered or what, what you need to find out about and how you can deliver that to meet the needs of the people that actually that work with you. Well, um, we've had a, a question from Tracy, who maybe is in this situation. She said, um, I'm just about to embark on my first education day for staff. Welcome. I have a questionnaire that upon return, they get entered into a raffle for some food, uh, negotiated the ability for all staff to attend in work time, flyers, emails, and intranet to publicize it. Is there anything else I can do to encourage people to attend? Well, it sounds like you've pretty much got it nailed, actually. <laughs> um, but I've got to say, the, the best sale is word of mouth. So it's actually getting out there and getting people talking about it. That's the key. Uh, you know, you can put all the posters up. If people don't look at a notice board, uh, you can put it out on email if they decide not to read the email. So you kind of, the, the best way, it's not the only way, but the best way to advertise something is to tell people, get out there. It's not always easy but to get out there and encourage people to come along and talk to them about it, engage in that conversation. The powers of persuasion. Yeah, absolutely. It's very hard to look somebody in the eye and say no. Oh, you're right there. Um, so Wilson has asked, uh, should the ULR role be separate from other roles, such as steward and health and safety, or can it be combined? Yeah, well, you know, in an ideal world, you would have enough people in every branch to, to do that. Um, the reality is, uh, in a lot of places, in a lot of workplaces, it is a, a combined role with health and safety or local rep or whatever. It's not perfect. Um, the the upside, I suppose, I shouldn't say it publicly, but the upside actually is if you're um, if you're doing a local rep's role and you don't get so much release for that uh, during your ULR release, you can actually do a little bit of that as well while you're out there doing your learning. You must still go out and do the learning role because that's what you get released for. But it doesn't hurt to combine the two on the same day and talk to people about other issues as well. Mm, so you wear many hats. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, 
we've had an interesting question from Christine. Um, Christine is in the finance sector and functional skills are a minimum job requirement. So I'm not sure how they could be used to engage with staff. Um, but are there refresher courses so staff can help their children or grandchildren with their homework? Or maybe if you're not, you, so as well as the refresher courses, if you don't use functional skills as a way to engage staff, how else can you do it? Oh, there's just so much stuff out there. Um, yeah, I mean, functional skills is the core of what we do. That's our driver. That's um, that's where the Union Learning Fund uh, gets its money from, which, which doesn't apply to the reps on the ground. That's about a different level. But on, on the grounds, uh, you need to encourage people to get, get out there and do learning and whatever interests them. It doesn't matter. I mean, still do the quick reads. I don't know if anybody out there has come across the quick reads, but they're brilliant. I actually had a guy, uh, he still works with me, actually, John, uh, and he curses me because he hadn't read a book for, uh, crikey, well, he said about 30 years he hadn't read a book since he left school, basically. And uh, he said, I don't bother with books anymore. I said, well, look, have a read of this. And it was actually by Ricky Tomlinson, Reading My Ass. Brilliant it. book, so yeah. funny, a few years ago now. And uh, I said, we'll just have a read of that. It's, it's designed to be quick and easy. It's only a thin book. And he, he, he said he read it in about an hour and a half. And he said, and he came back and he picked up another book and he said, now he can't stop reading. He's reading all the time again. And he, he, jokingly, he said, I curse you. He said, but it's so much, it's, it's just opened his mind up again. He started thinking about things again. And, you know, so it, it's quite an important thing to do. There's lots of different stuff. Um, the TUC provide loads of stuff. Um, just trying to think now. Uh, so there's, there's the uh, the cards, yep. those, those cards, what are they called? We've got um, the uh, Midlife Review. Yeah, Midlife, midlife Review Skills cards. Review. They cause a lot of fun. They, they, they're a great source of fun, especially with, when you do it, we do it at uh, Union Learning Forums where the reps get together and they sit there and do the use these cards to interview each other. It, it's, it's quite hilarious. But also it, it's quite powerful as well because it does make people think about the skills that they've got uh, they didn't realize they got you know just things like personal interaction being able to mm. talk to someone is quite a powerful skill but we don't think of it as a qualification but it Absolutely. is a really powerful thing so there's lots of stuff out there's lots of online tools one of my favorites at the moment is future learn mm -hmm. we've come across that which is a, a fantastic it's a free website uh which provides pre uh, degree course training and learning which is all written by a uh, senior uh, education lists and it's all uh, or it's all accredited through um, educational institutions such as universities and things like that so they're short taster courses mm -hmm. six eight weeks um, you do it all online it's all peer review so you get to interact with other learners as well uh, and they, they do courses from uh, basic hygiene right through to I think there was one a little while ago about the history of Portis which is a sunken city on the on the edge of on the coast of Italy which used to supply uh, Rome and things like that some really weird and wonderful courses out there I've done a couple one of them was uh, creative writing which I really really enjoyed I love doing the peer review bit with that mm. as well because other people are putting some wonderful stuff up that I wasn't able to read mm. So there's loads of stuff out there and it's really important that we use all that stuff because that's actually what most people want to do is, is do learning for fun. Uh, and and if, if you identify as a skills for life or functional skills issue within that, you can open a conversation up and talk about that. So we, but even if they haven't got any of those needs, you can still go out there and, and help them to learn for fun. It's great. Sign language, digital photography, all those stuff, all that sort of stuff. Um, all the resources that I was mentioned, including FutureLearn, um, our midlife skills review cards and the quick reads, we'll post links to those um, on, on the webinar recording site afterwards. So don't worry, we'll, we'll make sure you get access to those. Um, I think we've just got time for a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. um, we've got oh, so one that's from me. Um, what would you say your, your top three tips for ULRs are? If you had to give three tips, what would they wow. be? Uh, be confident um, and, and enjoy it and make it fun. That's the key thing, because if you're not having fun, you're not going to be able to sell it to anybody else. Uh, make sure you celebrate every success and, and concentrate on the little wins. Don't expect to have a room full of 35 people for every course, because that's not going to happen in reality. If you, if you put on a, a short one-day course or something and you get half a dozen people, that's a really good result. But make sure you record all that, get some pictures and, and stuff like that. 
Um, uh, one other thing, uh, make sure you plan. Fail to plan, plan to fail. It's an old adage that uh, was taught to me many years ago. You, you got, you got to, you got to plan ahead. Think about what you're doing. Best way to get release, actually, if you can, is to actually let the roster clerk or someone know six months in advance when you want your days off, because that makes a big difference. It's a lot easier for them. Not guarantee you'll always get them, but at least if they're in the diary early, they know it's coming up, so they can they can plan to help you plan. Um, so, some great tips there. Um, I think we, we've answered most of the questions. Um, if we haven't managed to get to all of them, I think we will we'll obviously get Ivan back because there's short, I'm sure there are loads more stories to tell. Um, so we'll definitely have you back for, episode, may not <laughs> <laughs> for episode two. I'm sure we all, we all do want Ivan back. Um, it just leaves me now to um, thank you all for joining the webinar and to uh, remind you to tune in for our next TUC webinar, um, which is about health and safety inspections. It's on October the 9th with uh, the TUC's health and safety policy officer, Hugh Robertson. Uh, you can sign up on the TUC education website and um, the same place where you signed up for today's webinar. Um, so thank you again. And um, we'll see you again for more stories from Ivor. <laughs>